Good morning, Frontline. How's everybody doing today? Good? All right. Let's see if my slides are working too, but it's okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Thank you, worship team. If we have any visitors, you're most welcome here today. All right, we have any co people coming from the States? Visiting? Anybody? No? Old timers? Okay, welcome. Welcome to Frontline. Hope you enjoy your visit. Pastor Gary's not here with us today. He is out. He's doing his own vacation. So he's getting refreshed and renewed and revived and coming back with new vigor for the word. And so we can continue to lift him up and Suzanne and then and that they enjoyed their vacation in Villanueva. I'm an elder here at the front line. And it is an honor and also a privilege for me to speak to you, with you all today. So speaking about vacations, summer is just around the corner. We all know that. I know, right? It's reason to celebrate. Um, some, of, some of you are making summer plans, probably going back to the States. Probably some of you are PCSing back to the States. Maybe some of you may, uh, according to your travel plans, you're probably going to go probably around Europe. No matter where you go, no matter where you're going, what your plans are, what may, whatever may transpire, I pray that your vacation will be a good one. Summer and traveling go hand in hand. So for our text today, we'll be talking about someone who's traveled. And I think you'll know him very well. But we'll look at it in a different kind of perspective. We'll try to see if we can, I can balance the traveling portion of what he's, he's gone through and what we usually go through. And what I'm, who I'm talking about, we're going to study about Noah today. There it is. God remembered Noah. And in your travels, if you don't leave her anything today, I'm going to let you know God remembers you. If God remembered Noah, he remembers you. No matter where you're going, you don't have to have the flat Stanley with you. God is always with you, right? Amen? Amen. So before we begin, can we just pray real quick? Dear Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this time, Father God. I thank you for the privilege of studying your word. So I just pray, Father God, that we stay focused and attentive and we learn, Father God, less of you, uh, more of you, and less of me, Father God. And we leave here, Father God, with new knowledge and new grace and new understanding. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Noah's travel is different like no other. And we'll be covering it today. My main text, I really don't have no main text, but we'll be, discover, we'll be focused on Noah. And usually his, uh, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it starts in Genesis chapter 6. So we'll be jumping from 6 all the way to chapter 8. So that's what we'll be going through. So the first thing you do when you travel you got to have a plan, right? So there's got to be a traveling plan. So you need to know, like, the location, the date, the time, and so, some of these aspects we need to know while, while we're doing this. So for me, in my case, I probably want to go back to Hawaii because that's where I'm from. I probably haven't seen my father in a while. It's been about five years, and my dad is almost like Noah's age. So I'd like to see, see him. And I probably want to go back maybe July... In time it right, maybe after July 4th weekend, while well, I still have some leave in there, and probably on an airplane. Seems, seems simple enough. But how about if you're PCSing? We know PCSing is a whole different story. When we're moving, there's tedious planning that comes along with a PCS move. We, out, we have to out-process the base, and we have to go off of this checklist, and I want to name a couple of them. Of course, we can't do anything without PCS orders, right? You got to have... The, even though you schedule your plane or you schedule your, uh, uh, to pick up your goods, your house of goods, they'll ask you, do you have your PCS order? If you don't have it, then we can't start. So you have to have that. Of course, you have to clear housing. You're going to have to find a way to ship your vehicle back. Of course, you're going to have to have the finances to do that. And, sh of course, the, the house of goods. So these are a few things that we do to out-process Ramstein. So it's a long and tedious list to accomplish. And I you know it requires a lot of planning, and a lot of patience. I can say definitely amen to that. Now, to do these things, you need appropriate offices. And that's why here in Ramstein, even though I've heard over and over again, it's hard to out-process Ramstein. If you can out-process Ramstein, then you can, like, that's a good thing. That's a good accomplishment. But now let's look at Noah. Look how he did his thing. So if we turn to our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 6, I'll be reading verses 9 to 14. Oh, there's, that's Noah's Ark. That's right. Now, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, 
blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. And so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make room in it and put, uh, coat it with pitch inside and out. So we hear, see here Noah. Basically, Noah got his PCS orders from God, didn't he? He said, not only that, but let's go through also that same out-processing checklist that we usually have, and I just mentioned, housing. So to clear housing, the ark was basically Noah's housing, right? So he had to make sure he had to build the housing. His vehicle, same thing, was the ark. His finance, who would finance Noah's trip? Not DOD, right? God was going to finance Noah's trip. And his, what was his house so good? Probably what, animals, his family, that was his house of goods. So looking at his checklist, you know, words like excitement, eagerness, anticipation, those don't jump out, right? Those don't jump out. In fact, when I looked at that, when I looked at that initially saw that and was studying, I was like, that's going to take a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of labor. And we all know how that is. We've moved once before, probably many times for more, most of you. So the obvious thing that I saw when I was comparing this and comparing this was that where was the support system for Noah? There was no housing office, finance office. He, had, he couldn't go to any TMO. There was nowhere to be found. So basically, he had to find out process through God. And, now, and during those times, that's got to take some faith to do that. For you, sometimes when you, when you out-process, the first, first term memory, you don't know the first thing about how to out-process you know, for say, what do I need to do? How, what do I need to ask? And so they all ask these things. So this, for Noah, wasn't going to be a vacation of any sort. In fact, this was going to be the total opposite. There's going to be a lot of hard work, like we said. In fact, did you know it took Noah and his sons about 120 years to build the ark? We can see that in Genesis 6.3. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So according to this Bible reference, we could see this, is God gave, this was said before God told Noah to build the ark. So it's almost like a timetable, like, okay, I'm going to give you guys 120 years and, see, and then I'm going to start the flood. So estimates on building a house, a new house, can go anywhere from five months to maybe a year, depending on multiple factors. There's the finding the right contractor, making sure all the paperwork, and then the proper funding. On that, uh, that picture of, uh, of uh, Noah's Ark, that is actually a replica in the Netherlands. You can actually see that if you go to Netherlands. It's a life-size replica. And it, you know how long it took this guy to do it? It took him about two years. But of course, he had modern-day equipment. He had saws, he had hammer, he had glue, he had duct tape. He had all these things, right, <laughs> to, to, to make this thing. So the Bible gives us the dimensions of the Ark, but it doesn't tell what kind of tools that Noah built. So I can't even start to imagine what he, what he used, rocks, or I don't know, but I'm sure something. So, but can you, have, can you imagine if you had to say, okay, I want to build something, and asking the contractor, how long is that going to take to build a house? Hmm. And they come back with an answer, about 100 years. About 100 years. That'd be like, I'll find somebody else. But, did, but let's notice here that Noah, did he complain about his assignment? No. Did he protest? No. And did he object? No. So we can see at the end of the chapter, in fact, we see in Genesis 6.22, Noah did everything just as God commanded. He did everything. A lot of times we complain, we protest, and we object to places, especially if there's an assignment that we don't want to go to. Oh, I don't want to go to that place. That place is too cold. Or I don't want to go to that. It's too hot. It's too humid. It's never, you never see the sun over there. We always have a reason to complain. But not Noah. He did every single thing that God commanded him to do. So since we're talking about traveling, let's jump ahead, like to the day of travel. We get excited on the day of travel, isn't it? Sometimes we can't even sleep the day before we travel because we're thinking about, okay, we've got to do this, we've got we to plan, make sure we have all our luggage and all this stuff. So for those of you who are going to, on a vacation, it brings joy and excitement. 
Yay, we're going to Rome. Yay, we're going to Prague. We're probably going back to the States. If you're PCSing, that's also uh, exciting because you're just like, where are we going to live? You know, how's the school system? You know, is there going to be a 24-hour Walmart? You know? Yes, that'd be great. So let's look at what Noah did in his day of travel. In Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. And it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the seventh, second month, on that day, all the springs of the great uh, deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So his launching wasn't really exciting, huh? And then also you can see in Genesis 7, 16, then the Lord shut him in. So he shut the ark and he was there. So let's, okay, when I read that, I said, let's stop and ponder this for a while. So when the, when the, the, uh, the flood started, how old was Noah? 600 years old. So I said, okay, let me do the math real quick. 600 years minus, let's say, 120 years to build the ark. So when he started to build the ark, let's say he's estimate around 480 years, right? When he started to build the ark. 480 years. Have you ever asked a person about their age and their answer kind of surprises you? You kind of like, how old are you? And then they tell you, if it's, if they, if it, if it's a good thing, they're like, really? You're that old? But if they look older than what they seem like and they say, they say their age, you're like, really? You know? You kind of like that, so that really surprised. And the difference between guys and girls, if I can inject this real quick, you ask a guy his age, no problem, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50 years old. You ask a woman their age, they're like, mm. sometimes they get offended, right? And sometimes like, yeah, I'd rather not stay, you know? It's, like, it's just like, can you imagine them asking Noah? If I was there, I really would, would like to ask Noah, hey, Noah, how old are you? And then he, his probably asked, his answer probably back to me, how old do you think I am? So I say, hmm, 75? He's like, no, keep going. Try 400, at least 400. I'm like, really? 400? You must CrossFit or something, right? You go to the gym or something? You do insanity? Can I get a copy of your workout? Something like that, right? Okay, back to Noah, sorry. Okay, so it was downpouring. It was darkness, thundering, rushing water shook the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So that must have been frightening for him. Let's look in Genesis chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. And it says, Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. And only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. So the waters flooded earth for 150 days. That's interesting, says it. And in verse 23, it says, no, Only Noah was left and those were with him in the ark. So this statement alone tells me that God remembered Noah when he closed that ark. He didn't, he didn't forget about him. But then also we can see in Genesis 6, 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So everything was gone at this time. Death was everywhere. Now there was only silence. And Noah was left with the awful difficulty of no movement, no answer, and no word from God. So Noah floated in this wooden structure. There was no explanation, no prompting, no voice of, God, no voice of hope from God. Noah faced this. Basically, he thought he faced this all on his own. And sometimes we do that in our spiritual life. We find out, Lord, where are you in, our, in our, my spiritual life? I need you during this time of pain and suffering and grief. And sometimes we, we ask, Lord, where are you? And I'm sure this is what Noah is feeling about right now. Everything was closed. And he was, it was almost like a box coffin that he was in. It was dark. Remember... If you were to read Noah's story, there was only one window, the Bible says, and it was high up. But of course, according to the rain and the flood, it probably was covered up, and it wasn't nothing. Obviously, there was no sunshine during those times. The other thing we want to note about in, in, this, in his, his, his adventure, in Genesis 6.18, God spoke to Noah and said that he was the only righteous man in all this generation. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons, and your wives, and your sons' wives with you. So the ark was a source of salvation for Noah. It would protect him from the storm. But Noah didn't hear any word of getting out of the ark. So how about the end of the story? You know, 
when you're traveling on an airplane, you know how the captain gets on the, gets on the speaker and he introduces himself and he goes and he uh, gives you a, like basically a, a general idea, idea what, you, or what time you're going to arrive. This is just like, hello, this is your captain speaking and the weather's looking good today. The skies are blue and we'll be arriving at our destination in about nine hours. Enjoy your flight. But now in Noah, how did Noah look? How, how has God answered Noah? Noah, this is God speaking to you, the great I am. Forecast, wind, rain, and wet. The time frame to our destination, unknown. And the final destination, also unknown. Enjoy your trip, right? That's what, the, that's what Noah was stuck into. He didn't, he know, he didn't know anywhere he was, he was, where he was going, how long it was going to take. He was just stuck there. Basically, this was a time of reflection for Noah. Can you imagine that? Those who are claustrophobic, you probably couldn't imagine that. You probably try to scream your way out of it. But for this was a time for self-discovery for Noah. I know a lot of time for us, like when, when also when the airplane is taken off, there's that dreaded announcement. I hate that announcement when they say, uh, what's that announcement? It says, at this time, we request that all mobile phones, pagers, radios, and remote controls, toys be turned off for the duration of the flight, as these items might interfere with the navigational communication equipment on this aircraft. We request that all electrical devices be turned off until we fly above 10,000 feet, and we will notify you when it's safe to use such devices. And there it is. I hate that announcement, to tell you the truth, because I'm stuck with my electronic, like, I love my electronic device. So I don't know about you, but when they tell me to turn it off, I go through electronic withdrawal. I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, my, my hands are like, what am I going to do with my hands? I can't text. I can't do anything. It feels uncomfortable. And I'm like, this can't be. You know, how can an airline do such a horrible act? This is almost like inhumane for me. So I say, no. But then you know what I do? I go right down and go on my knees and pray real quick. Lord, I pray, Lord, please take off and let's reach 10,000 feet. Amen. So I, 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 so I can turn on my iPhone again. All right, let's go back to Noah again. So one of the important questions to ask at this point and the similar points in our scripture is why does God allow for these silences in our life? These periods of like wilderness. Why does God set us on our way and seem to withdraw from us? A few examples like the nation of Israel was allowed. They, were, they experienced a powerful, miraculous salvation from God through the exodus, through the Red Sea, and then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 more years. Why was David anointed king and then driven from wilderness by Saul? And why was uh, Jesus driven to the wilderness after he, the dove ascended, descended to him and gave his baptism and forced to go into the time of testing and temptation? Why these patterns? We'll see. It. The answer probably is in Genesis 8.1. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the lively stock that were with him in the ark. And he sent wind over the earth, and the waters receded. So in fact, the Lord had not forgotten Noah. But Noah's experience, thought he, was, he thought he was forgotten. Sometimes that's what the Bible says in Isaiah. You know, God's ways and God's thoughts are not ours. We're not meant to understand these things. So, when, so that's probably when I die and I go to heaven, I'm going to ask. There's a lot of questions I want to ask the Lord. And... I'm sure Noah had some questions at that time. Let's continue along in Genesis 2, 8, verse 2 to 5. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heaven had been closed, and the rain had been stopped, falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. And then continue on to 11 and 12. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in the bleak was a fleshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth, and he waited seven more days and sent the dove out again. But this time, it did not return to him. So we know the Mount Ariat is in the region of Turkey. There's a lot of stories of people who have been searching it. They haven't actually been found yet. They've been trying to look for it. So presumably it landed there. So Noah finally was able to look out his window. So after floating for like over a hundred day, days, 
and not to be able to see where he was going. He had no idea what was outside the boat. He was wondering when it would come to an end. It's unlike what we do when we travel today on an airline, right? As soon as that airline hits, we hit the tarmac, we start going along, and then it stops, and you hear that, boom, everybody starts unbuckling and goes for it, right? They go for their luggage and try to leave as soon as they can. But for Noah, that didn't happen for Noah. As soon as he hit the ground and everything receded, that sound didn't come. It didn't come. He had to wait. He was there for 110 days. So can you imagine if you were on that airplane, you reached your destination, and you couldn't leave yet. You're stuck there. I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to be patient with us. You have to stay in the airplane while we think what we need to do. We're not talking about hours. This could take days. Would that drive you crazy? I'm sure it would drive some of us crazy. So the first thing, but there was hope for Noah. But the first thing God did was what? He sent the wind. Just the simple things like the wind blowing and the boat beginning to, to move again and the water actually resting gave Noah hope and tell them, you know, God, God remembered me. So when you're traveling, no matter where you are, no matter airport you're taking, whatever bus you're riding or whatever ship or boat you're in, God remembers you. God knows where you're at. God meets you at your need. Doesn't ma- it doesn't matter. My God, our God never sleeps nor slumbers. He meets your needs where you're at. Not like us sometimes when we Skype, you got to coordinate. Hey, you know, my time here and your time in the States, we got to coordinate so we can talk to each other. Some per- one person will be awake and one person will be asleep. But not God. God never sleeps and God never slumbers. So the boat moved by the breath of God and then it stopped by the purpose of God. And Noah realized that God hadn't forgotten him. And there was going to be actually an end to this story. So we know, in the, we know the story of Noah, that he sent out the raven, and he came back, and he sent out the dove. But I want to focus on the dove. The dove of Noah with the olive leaf, and it came back. That symbolizes, a, that was a, like a profound symbol that there was life out there again for them. And that once again, he can go out there and start life all over again. So Noah realized this, is not, this story wasn't going to end in destruction, and the ark was gonna, not going to be his home like forever. In Genesis 8, 13 to 16, it says, On the first, day of Noah, first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then remembered and covering from the ark and saw that the first surface of the ground was dry. So by the 27th day of the second month, and the earth was completely dry. Then, Noah, then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your wives. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the, all the clean animals and clean bird, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the, peace, the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all the creatures as I have done. And I like verse 22. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. God remembers. You know, in Hawaii, there's always, there's tons of rainbows in Hawaii. Sometimes, one time I've seen three rainbows at one time. It's a constant reminder. When I see a rainbow, I love seeing a rainbow. When it's that little rain, little little, uh, mist, and all of a sudden the rainbow shows up. I haven't seen much rainbows here in Germany. Am I right? I don't know. I didn't see no many rainbows here in Germany, but in Hawaii, you see rainbows almost on a daily occurrence. And it, and it reminds me. And, you know, when you see those things, God, does it, is it a reminder to us? I think it's more of a reminder to God. God says, you know what? Every time I see that rainbow, I think about you guys. We, all, we live in this time now where it's wicked and a lot of things are happening, but God remembers us. God has mercy and God has grace. God remembers you. Each and every one of you. No matter what situation you are, no matter what you've done, God remembers. Not only remembers, but he loves you. And he's established that grace and mercy and compassion on you. Why not give it to others? A lot of times, you know, we don't give that grace and mercy when we're traveling. If someone cuts you off, there goes the grace factor, right? Instead, you, wanna, you don't want to extend mercy. You want to extend a lot of other things to that person. There are two important things we want to we can talk about here in Noah's behavior to look at. The first thing, when Noah moved the cover and he opened the door and saw that the land was dry, he was 601 years old. So he's been a year, about a year in, into that ark. And I'm sure he was like, wanted to run outside. But he didn't, did, did Noah go right out? 
No, he had to wait. He had to wait on the Lord to tell him, okay, it's safe to go out now. You know, you ever, ha- ever had that happen? You know, like, I, it's amazing how pets can do that. Now, some people, they'll tell their pet, okay, stay, and then they walk away, and the pet stays, and then you say, okay, come, they can come. Or even harder, when they put up, you know, food in front of them, or they put it on top of their head, I see it in a commercial or on YouTube, and then they tell them, don't eat, wait, wait, and then they eat, and then they say, okay, you can eat it, and then you can eat it. That takes a lot of discipline, you know? And so I'm sure Noah was very impatient at that time. Here we are stuck in the boat for so long, and the door is open, dry as ground now. Can we go out now? Can I go out? And they, the Lord finally gave him permission to go out. But of course, when he, when he first opened the door, and let's say he opened the door and he saw outside, I don't think it was green and luscious. It wasn't like that yet. Maybe that's why I can think one of the reasons why the Lord didn't let us send out. He had to wait for the water to recite and the, the, drought, the, the ground to dry up. And when Noah was able to get out, what did he do his first thing? He, did a, he, he, he made a sacrifice to the Lord. So God sacrificed to God, thanking him for bringing him through that and probably bringing him to his PCS, actually, destination. You know, when you finally reach your final destination, it feels like home. So he knew he was finally home, and so he thanked the Lord. And verse 21, 821 says, The Lord smelled a pleasing aroma, and in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. So my question is t- to you all is, do you reflect very often on God's word to you when you read God's word? When you read the announcement of God's love and his commitment to his people, are you convicted by that? These are actually like love letters to you. You know, sometimes when you're courting, you see, me and my wife celebrated 28 years of our anniversary. But I courted my wife five years. In the Philippines, there's a thing called courtship. So I courted my wife five years. So I know my wife for about 32, 33 years. And I remember those times we used to write love letters, love notes to each one. Each one. And those are when I pull out sometimes when we move and, and I see those uh, memos, those little notes, that brings a smile, a fond memory of what happens. That's what God's word should do to you. When you read upon it and reflect upon it and God's love and grace and mercy on you, it should bring a smile to your heart, a smile to your face, knowing what God has done for each and every one of you. And you can't pay it back. You know, if, someone, if you save someone's life, I owe you big time, right? When, anywhere, anytime, any place, call on me, I'll be there. God's done that for you. You can't repay this. God remembers you. I'd like to close also with Isaiah chapter 54, verses 9 and 10. To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. As God remembered Noah before, during, and after the flood, God will also remember you during your travels, wherever you may be this summer. So no matter, remember, during your travels this summer, wherever, whatever may happen, whatever you're doing, whatever may transpire, God remembers you, and God loves you, just like he did Noah. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the study of Noah and how you remembered him, even though it was closed up into this ark and stayed there for so many days. Lord, I don't know if I could do that, but I thank you, Father God, that there's wisdom in this story. And so I thank you, Father God, for everybody's here today. I thank you for their, I pray for their traveling mercies, whether they they've came here or they're going on vacation or PCSing, Lord. And I just thank you for what they've done and how you ordained their steps and you watch over them now. So as we get ready, to, get ready to leave, I ask for your traveling mercies. Thank you, Father God, for this time. Bless the remainder of today. We ask you and praise you. Pray all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you need prayer, there's a prayer team here. Uh, and uh, if you need any else, I don't think so. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. God bless you. Enjoy your day.